wow. I think uh, for me, I, I'll just say, you know, if I had the luxury of innovating right now, I would have said, thank you very much. You know, that's the innovation from my side because what the speakers before me have done, really, you know, it's amazing. I think from touching to the consumer insights to the out of the box ideas that Ali Sheikh and Balki have done in the region to Jamal's uh, you know, balancing act, I would say, where you have a business for a purpose. Um, but really, you know, uh, great to be here, guys. And again, um, this is what I think the essence of today was, the thought leadership for the future. Irrespective of what you hear today from a few of us, I think what you're seeing is how this industry is evolving and what these leaders are doing that we are all, uh, you know, coming together and playing our role. Before I move forward, and again, I'll uh, request Maliki if you can play with the slides as well for me as well, um, because that way it'll be easier. Um, so before, as I move forward, let me first introduce you to Actia, you know, the company that I'm very proudly today presenting here. So like I said, let me begin with the Actia story. So who, who is Actia? Most of you probably won't know, uh, but you know, this company in fact was, as my friend Jamal mentioned, you know, was started by the founding father of the country that we all live in, Sheikh Zayed himself. He started this uh, organization in 1978. And, you know, when you think of it in 50 years, where has this come? And to me, it's an epitome of, you know, the topic that we are talk today talking about how this company has grown from being one single factory to being today playing in multiple categories, around 20 brands and a footprint which expands to six countries in the region, exporting to more than 30. And above all, I think in our industry, one thing that sometimes we all miss out, who leads that innovation? For me, it's those 4,000 Actians. It's all of you out there as an industry. You know, there's not a laptop, there's not a computer, that's not a process as a system, it's each one of you. It's the teams that we just saw the great work that comes through. And, and that's what the what I call the Actians who build this organization today to being one of the largest FMCG in the region and still growing. Um, and, and which I think is a testimony of, to me, innovation, not just on product alone, but on the whole process of business from end to end, from a full value chain perspective. As we look at, you know, what are the businesses that we play in? We have two segments as Actia. So we have the agri segment where we compete a little bit with Jamal and uh, the team trying to sell it to Balki for uh, whatever, you know, their products. So which is the flower. We also take care of those who sometimes let us enjoy some of those foods and other things, i.e. animal feed. So we have that part of the one part of the business. And then we have a you know, quite a wide portfolio of consumer segments from ranging from water, juice, dairy, frozen veg, bakery, dates, protein. So, so we play in that arena, water being our single largest business today, which is the Alan water, where we are number one across the UAE and in many markets across the region as well. So that's what Actia is and that's what we stand for. Um, again, like I said, a very diverse group uh, and something that has, has been inherently grown in this region, started in this region, and continues to expand um, and shine throughout the uh, Middle East region. Moving on, let me come to the innovation ecosystem, as I call it. To me, innovation is not just about, you know, uh, just one launch or anything. It's a full uh, gambit of what we do. Now, today, I'll keep the discussion more focused to some of the uh, success stories, that was the topic that was given to me, which uh, to be fair to Sumit, you know, was a much, much, much tougher topic for me personally. If it was about failures, it would have been much easier for me because that's what I have seen more in my life on innovation than success stories. You know, it, it, success stories are far and few. Uh, while the innovations excites everyone, the example I always give is innovations is like taking a little kid to a toy store and, you know, then leaving him alone there and before you know he will try to buy the whole store and in the end he can't buy anything because money won't last that long so it's it's a matter of choices what do you do because yes you know all of us want to go and grow and do many things reality is you need to pick and choose 
And that's where that file fulcrum comes in. That's where the tipping point comes in in making an innovation successful or not. What we know is today, you know, all of you, and I don't know if everyone is aware, but you know, according to a few researchers, that by 2025, the FMCG industry is going to be about $15 trillion. Again, $15 trillion, and that's what each one of you on this call is contributing towards. And 90% of that is in the food and beverage arena. So it's a huge industry that we play on. Now with that, what comes the challenge is how do you keep on innovating? How do you keep on growing when the base is so big? It's one of the largest industries globally that everyone uh, you know, touches every single day. The way I look at it is the only way you can win is if you accept the fact boss is right. And who's the boss? The boss is the consumer, not my boss. But that's the boss. You need to take care of that boss. Whether it's the he, whether it's a she, you know, whoever is the consumer is the one that we need to go after. You know, listen to him and listen to her. And that's the only way we would succeed. And, and I'll show you that, you know, in the current environment, and again, Jamal touched upon it, and obviously Balki before, to me, it's a 3D combination as we look at it. It's the consumer, it's the sustainability. Yes, it's not mine, it's for the generations to come. I'm somebody who's here to pass it to the next generation. And there is a regulatory body as well, which is involved, which you know is today there and is getting tighter with the new regulations that are coming in. It's coming up with the probably the right environment it's creating, but we need to adapt ourselves. So the way I look at it is the car is moving, the road is moving, and it's going up, down, left, right. So you know there's a lot of moving parts here. So hence the three D. And what's at the Heart of it is that health and wellness is getting more and more important. Like Jamal was mentioning about uh, Mr. Abdullah al Orev, that you know, food is health. You know, that's something is like oxygen. Imagine if there was no food on this planet. You know, no, none of us would survive if there's no water. So I think the cause that we as an industry have it is much bigger than just you know selling some items what we are doing here is we are like the what i call the hard oxygen we are the hard oxygen for the human beings here hard and liquid you know so while yes there's oxygen required there's food required as well and as we do that i think whether it be the consumer whether it be the sustainability agenda whether it be the regulatory we need to keep those in mind because all of them are changing and we saw 2020 how things changed whether it was the e-commerce coming up the dark kitchens growing, you know, on what's happening on sustainability agenda, how the regulators are looking at this new environment. So as long as we cater to those three elements, I think then you start really going towards a successful innovation. Interestingly, when I come closer to the home, you know, what we see here is that whether it be non-communicable diseases, obesity, diabetes, we know our region is famous for, along with few other things, these things as well, unfortunately. Out of the top 10 diabetic countries, five are here in our region, you know. And, and, and that behavior has come through high consumption, you know, a lot of personal disposable income, urbanization, you know, bit of the camel to Cadillac phenomena, where, you know, people have gone through a generation where there was nothing before 1970. And then, you know, thanks to the, uh, black oil that came in here, black gold, that everything was available. And people jumped from, you know, not having, probably just having powdered milk to now having organic milk in 30 years time. So you, you have that trend that came through, which resulted in some health issues that we can see across. And these will only keep on getting bigger and bigger as the population ages. Imagine today the population is much younger in our region. As the population ages, and with those numbers, this will become a serious uh, pandemic issue, which we are headed towards. Now, while the awareness is there, people are aware of those numbers. Interestingly, one thing that there are consumers are not willing to compromise is the taste. Taste still remains paramount. 
because we are not in a medicinal business. People still want to indulge. Consumers still want to enjoy. They still want to have their Betty Crocker cake. They still want to have their tacos. They still want to have the best flour and they still want to have, you know, the best tasting yogurt, etc. So, so taste remains paramount. And this is what I call for all of us, the seesaw. You need to balance the two, the taste and the health and nutrition. You cannot go on one or the other. And, and we need to absolutely balance the seesaw as we go beyond because otherwise, and for any innovation to work, those two elements need to be balanced. And, and only then, and hence what I said at the beginning, it's really challenging. I don't know, I personally, when I was a kid, could never balance the seesaw on both sides. So it's, it's really tough. How do you balance it and make it uh, go from there on? That said, you know, I'll take you through a couple of uh, examples, what Actia has done over the last, I would say, six to eight years. And again, very proudly, I'm presenting the work of the team who have taken on this as a commitment that as an organization, yes, while we are here to make money, but we have a bigger you know, duty as well towards the larger society. And, and with that into account and taking that commitment into account, there were a few launches that I think, you know, have really changed the few of the categories, the way they've been looked at before. Let me begin with the water, which is the flagship business for Actia. 2016, Actia launched the first Alan Zero. There was nothing called zero in the category here. Today, it's 5% of the category. You know, it's a premium offering. What was it built on? Going back to my consumer perspective, it was built on zero sodium, low salt, which was one of the things. Did it marry with the regulator in regulators as well? Absolutely. The regulators were looking for something similar. And is it much more sustainable? Absolutely. It helps you, you know, keep more healthy lifestyle, etc. So as you bring those three elements together, you had, you know, something which became a hero is today, like I said, to create a segment, a premium segment in a commoditized bottle water category and to sustain it now for almost six years at a 5% of the category, not an easy task. And again, kudos to the team who developed this from the basic concept to the execution and then is still going on strong for us. Similarly to that, in 2018, the company and the team came up with something one step forward. How can we get into, and this was first time globally, a vitamin D water. You know, the challenge here was, yes, many companies have tried it to do, but it was compromised on taste. The challenge here was no flavor, identical to pure water, no color, yet giving you 10% of your daily requirement. Of vitamin D. Now, why vitamin D? Again, going back to the consumer and the regulatory environment that we are in, while we all live in a sun-blessed region, none of us go out uh, in the sun because it's too harsh. So, and and there's a clear learning that you know the the vitamin D deficiency in this region is one of the highest globally as well. So, hence, vitamin D deficiency. Regulators are asking for it. Governments are asking for it. What can we do as one of the stakeholders for the industry? What's my role? Yes, my role is to sell more. Yes, my role is to gain share and make money and deliver profit to the shareholders. But is there a bigger platform there? And that's what I call business with a purpose. That yes, I think we don't need, I think gone are the days where CSR was a function within our organization. Today, where we are, it's a business with a purpose. Yes, we need to do business, but let's do a business which benefits the larger society as well, not just uh, the financial and the p &Ls. Next, where the team went, again, looking at different segments. You know, yes, there are little babies who come up, who, whose requirements are very different. For them, you know, you, can't, you need to get the purity at its best, as I call it. You know, while we were talking about low salt, here you need to talk about low salts, bromate, fluoride, nitrate, as pure as water can be, because those ones are really sensitive. The little tummies are very sensitive. How can you give them water, which is even more pure than the pure water that we all can consume? And came out a new brand, came out as something very different in this market again, where we know how high the birth rate is globally versus many other countries. So you have a 
a market where there is a need for certain product which helps those babies. Now, interestingly, with the younger population, with the birth rate, this is a big opportunity still to be, you know, fully um, maximized. But I think, again, the logic the team followed was, as I explained, let's start with the different age group. Let's go after a segment that requires, that probably is unable to tell you what they need, but can we do it? To me, this was a replica of the Apple. Who would have thought a phone would have come out without a dial pad? Today, we all probably use a phone without a dial pad. You know, who would, those babies wouldn't tell you, but somebody had to think it through and kudos to the R&D teams who thought about it, that this is how uh, the product needs to be formulated for that segment of the population. Moving on a classic, I think this is where, you know, our partnership with YoPlay came in. I, I wouldn't talk more about it, except balancing taste with health. Yes, there's a lactose-free uh, immunity challenge, allergies, those are growing every single year. Um, you know, in our grandparents' time, the allergies were much less. It was a different society, different kind of health issues. Today, we all know what kind of number of allergies we have, what challenges you have. Yet again, going back, we don't want to compromise on taste. So I don't know if you've had this product or not, but once you have this product, you won't even figure out that it's lactose free. It just tastes as any other yogurt would. And, and that was a challenge. A couple of iterations, but finally we got it right. Uh, again, trying to balance uh, the two sides of the equation. Flour, which is another uh, commoditized commodity that we can talk about. I think the team here, again, went from being just three SKUs or three offerings to 24. You don't always have to look at, you know, formulations and reformulations, but take into account the occasion and the segmentation. Is there a different flower for the for our friends from the Arab world versus the friends from the north uh, side of the northwestern province to the central part of Asia, you know, the Pashtun, the Kops, the bakery, patent, you know, so again, divide and see how you can add value because all of them are now more demanding. Going back to those consumers, they will not accept something which is a lowest common denominator. Gone are those days when you had one soap that would apply to everyone. Today, everyone is looking for a differentiation and how do you create that differentiation? And I think that's what the team did quite well in, in this example. Last but not least, I think we touched upon sustainability. Sustainability is something which, uh, again, as an organization, a UAE-based uh, flagship organization is very close to our heart. And we have committed that, you know, we will reduce our carbon footprint from door to uh, your door, from our door to the consumer's door as we go through that. And there are certain commitments Actia has already made and is on its way happening. So 100%, whether it's recycled cartons that we use, 30% of packaging is recycled, reduction in paper, plastic, and the carbon footprint. Like I said, we have optimized our route to market from literally from the suppliers to our warehouses, to our distribution centers, to the stores. You know, if you do that, you can reduce roughly, we've reduced 3,000 trips. Imagine the carbon footprint that that's, that releases out and saves our mother earth with. So again, business with a purpose. It's not just to you know do as a CSR activity. It's something built within the purpose, helps us even improve our PNL delivery and helps us deliver something which we can pass on to the generations in future, which is even in better shape than what probably we got from our ancestors. And it's in that spirit that the last one I'll share with you, and we are the first one in the region, and extremely proud is a plant bottle that we are launching. And we are literally in the middle of this launch. You will start seeing it in stores. It's already reached some of the food service accounts. Uh, this bottle is 100% from plant-based source. It comes from natural renewable sources. You know, it, it has, it's fully combustible and biodegradable. It has 60% reduction in energy. Uh, it's an amazing product, you know, when it comes to that. Now, does it come with its challenges? Yes. Does the shelf life is still two to three months? Yes. Versus the 18 month, that is the normal plastic raisin that it goes through. But I think that's where the forward 
thinking comes out. As an organization, we need to take care of the place that where we all live and we care about, then we need to make sure we act on it. Without acting, you know, those are just simple words. So this is something we've launched. We just uh, won two awards for it, one end of last year, one uh, two weeks back at the Gulf Food for being most impactful, sustainable launch at the Gulf Food, one from the guys in UK, uh, because this is something, again, like I said, first in the region, completely it gets uh, uh, biogradable in 60 to 80 days. You can put it in landfill, nothing remains out of it, and you know it goes out. So those are the initiatives. Like, again, I keep on repeating, for me, the clear thing is that, you know, how do you run the business while not compromising the environment that we are in and innovating in that on that front because otherwise innovation any one of us can launch a new innovation as we speak so that's about it i think for me as an industry when we look at it especially when i reflect in the last 18 to 24 months i think the resilience the ingenuity the creativity that all of you have shown as being part of this industry is tremendous the supply chain you know, that's why I said we are the oxygen. Some of us may or may not think that way. There are the healthcare providers. To me, you, are, you all are the life care providers. You're not in a food industry. You are in a life care industry because without the food industry, there'll be no life left here. And as we go beyond, I think we all need to remain committed to the sustainability and innovation for better agenda. That's the key. Yes, innovation is key but it's about innovation for a better tomorrow and to me that's where we will hand over a more greener cleaner planet to the generations to come that's it thank you